I'm Richard Walker, Executive Director of the Benjamin Rush Institute. We hope you enjoy today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. This series would not be possible without the support of foundations that endorse the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute, our student chapter members, and individuals like you. Through your support, we are able to continue informing and educating today's medical students about the benefits of patient-centered, doctor-focused methods for the practice of medicine, just like those discussed in this series. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the Benjamin Rush Institute and the medical students we serve. While you're there, please consider a donation to support our educational programs and events just like this one. You can donate by card, check, or by mail. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. Hello. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining uh, today's Benjamin Rush Institute virtual event series. My name is Rebecca Kiesling. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We have a great group here. Uh, we have our friends not only on Zoom, uh, but we are live on Facebook. We also have a number of chapters joining us today. Um, so we are streaming live uh, at some of our medical school chapters throughout the country. So we have a really great group um, joining us today. Um, it is an unprecedented time in our country uh, to be doing these virtual events. And we have been, Benjamin Rush Institute uh, is a 10 year old organization that is dedicated to furthering healthcare, uh, free market healthcare education um, that medical school students are not receiving. Medical schools are primarily funded through big business, big pharma, big education, um, big business and big government. And we need to make sure that medical students really are getting a complete education about all the alternatives that are out there, including uh, free market, free enterprise. Um, and without organizations like the Benjamin Rush Institute, they're just not understanding that there is more than big government medicine. Um, we are very excited about our guests today. Grace Marie Turner is the founder, president, and trustee of the Galen Institute, which is a public policy research organization that she founded in 1995 to promote an informed debate over free market ideas for health reform, a natural partner from the Benjamin Rush Institute. She has been instrumental in developing and promoting ideas for reform to transfer power over healthcare decisions to doctors and patients. She speaks and writes extensively about incentives to promote a more competitive, patient-centered marketplace in the healthcare center sector. Uh, she testifies regu regularly before Congress and advises senior government officials, governors, and state legislatures, legislators on healthcare policy. Uh, she has served as a member on, of the Long-Term Care Commission and as a member of the Medicaid Commission, making recommendations to modernize and improve Medicaid. Previously, Grace Marie served for a three-year term on the National Advisory Board for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. She has been published in hundreds of major newspapers and speaks extensively in the US and abroad, including at the London School of Economics, Oxford University, and the Gregorian University of the Vatican. She is the founder and facilitator of the Health Policy Consensus Group, which serves as a forum for analysts from market-oriented think tanks around the country to analyze and develop policy recommendations. Right now, as we are in an election crisis still, um, as we are in the middle of a pandemic, as we don't know what next year is going to hold for healthcare reform, and as healthcare drastically needs some reform, there is no one better uh, to talk about what healthcare reform is going to look like in next year than Grace Marie Turner. We are very lucky to have her here today. Um, you can ask questions uh, in any of the chat features that you have available to you. We'll be moderating those uh, questions as we go along. And at the end of Grace Marie's speaking today, uh, I'll jump on, back on. And as always, we'll get to those questions. Um, we are, we're going to keep this right at about an hour. 
and you are not here to listen to me speak. So I'm going to get off and turn this over to our guest today, Grace Marie Turner. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's really, I'm such a huge fan of the Benjamin Rush Institute and have done a number of um, of debates and live presentations and really love meeting you and seeing your enthusiasm for your work. Certainly a very different kind of medical school education than you had anticipated, I think, with your um, with the virtual learning that you're doing now, but we will get back to normal. And I wanna talk with you a little bit about the, the state of play of where we are with health reform and some of the options going forward, because certainly, obviously, this is all going to very much impact your, your future. So I'm going to, um, right now, go to my PowerPoint presentation, and we'll go through that, and then we will come back and look forward to taking your questions. So health reform is sort of always with us, I think, and we always need change and the options of how much change we can make have a lot to do with the political environment in Washington, which we're still waiting to figure out what that's going to finally be. But just a couple of ground rules. Um, people think, oh, you're a conservative. You don't believe in universal coverage. Couldn't be more wrong. I absolutely believe in universal coverage. I don't mean believe in universal government run healthcare systems, but I think there are a lot of ways we can get to universal coverage without the government taking over our healthcare system. So one of the things that I think very few people know is that 99% of people who are in the United States lawfully have access to coverage today. They just aren't enrolled. We've got about 28, 29 million people estimated to not have health insurance. Many of them are eligible for existing government programs, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, or employer-based health insurance, and they're not signed up. So we really need to look at what can we do to incentivize people who are eligible for these programs and not enrolled to become covered rather than thinking about creating large new government healthcare programs. One of the reasons that many people don't sign up for coverage is that it's just too expensive. They can't meet their mortgage payment, pay their bills, and then buy groceries for their family if they have a huge bill for health insurance coverage. So a key issue is getting health costs down and health coverage costs down so more people can afford health insurance. It's a large and growing share of not only US and, and world health spending, but it's also really a burden to patients. And when you look at families that are really trying and struggling to figure out how they're gonna afford healthcare, what do they do when they get surprise medical bills, when they know that they have an upcoming surgery, they can't meet the deductible, it's really a serious problem, whether you have coverage or not. And too many people really feel like cogs in a wheel. They don't feel that they have control over their choices. None of the choices that are available to them are either affordable or what they want. The networks may be too narrow. They have a child with cancer and none of the pediatric cancer hospitals in their plan cover the care their child needs. It's really tragic that we have narrowed down the choices so much that people can't afford or find a policy that meets their needs. And one of the reasons for that is that 80% of all healthcare in the United States is either directly or indirectly controlled by one level of government or not. Professor Mark Pauley, who is a, a really the guru of health policy at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, has done a recent paper for the American Enterprise Institute where he really analyzes this and shows the control that government entities of one sort or another have over our healthcare choices, not doctors and patients. And that has been since the beginning of the Galen Institute, my goal is to put power back in the hands of doctors and patients, not in the hands of government bureaucrats who do not have the experience, both for the art and science of medicine that you do. I was actually in the, um, the gallery sitting up on the, uh, in the, 
top floor above um, the House chambers, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in March of 2010, and member after member Democrat, on the Democratic side of the aisle kept going to the microphone and saying, finally, finally, we were going to pass this legislation to get to universal coverage and join the rest of the world in having universal coverage. Well, that actually hasn't worked out. And it is called the Affordable Care Act. But, and Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi said over and over to reporters at a meeting, it's affordable, affordable, affordable care act. Well, most people feel it's not. I talked with a dad in Fredericksburg, Virginia, down the highway from Leesburg, Virginia, where I live. And he said he'd just gotten the bill for his health insurance premium for his family, and it's $4,000 a month. He said, it's either that or my mortgage payment. I can't do both. And here was a man who's, who's working. He didn't have job-based coverage for his family. He wanted to make sure his family was covered. He was talking with one of his state senators who's facilitated this conversation. And he said, what am I supposed to do? So I hear and that, that really echoes with me. What is he supposed to do? He's trying his best. He doesn't like the choices that are available. And his premium is take it or leave it, $4,000 a month for an individual or a family policy in the individual market. And he only had that one choice. So when you look at the ACA, we're now more than 10 years out since the Affordable Care Act passed. Before it passed, there are 11.8 million Americans who had individual health insurance coverage, not subsidized by them. Some states may have provided some stipends, but the federal government was not involved in subsidizing that coverage or really organizing that market. Six years later, by six years after the first policies were sold under the ACA in 2013, going to effect in 2014, at that point, 12.4 million people had policies. So the federal government in that time had spent 248 billion dollars on subsidies for Affordable Care Act plans. But yet we had an increase in individual coverage of only 6, 600,000 plans, a net increase. So that shows that we are far, far from the goal of universal coverage that the members aspired to when they passed this law in 2010. And the when you think about the numbers, that means that we are on average spending almost $70,000 a year to subsidize health insurance policies for this small number of people. And the reason for this is so many people lost the policies that they had before. They had the, the only choices they had were in the exchange markets to be able to buy Affordable Care Act insurance that they did not find to be affordable. Many people have dropped out. In fact, we've got about two to three million people who previously had coverage who've dropped out of this market because they simply couldn't afford to pay the premiums. So when you look at, okay, well, where has the coverage expansion been? It's been primarily in Medicaid expansion. So between 2013, 2016, we need to update these numbers, but the percentages are really still the same that the private coverage in expansion was only about 17% of the coverage expansion. I think it's probably less now because so many people have dropped out of the market, but Medicaid was well over four fifths of the market was of expansion and coverage was medi from through Medicaid. So if we would have called it the Medicaid Expansion Act, it would have been a lot more straightforward and a lot simpler to do rather than this convoluted disruption and really destruction in many cases of the market for private health insurance, all the federal subsidies, all the rules and regulations, when really the primary, the coverage primarily has been through Medicaid. But when you look at Medicaid and when you start practice, I hope you don't get a payment like this one that a physician friend of mine sent me. This was his payment for seeing a patient with complex lung disease spent hours with this, with this person over a course of treatment. He got a payment from the Medicare, Medicaid processing company, the Hartford Insurance Company, of six cents. So when you wonder why don't all physicians take Medicaid, this is why. 
because they simply can't afford to do it. Most physicians who take Medicaid do it really as a charity case, even though Medicaid forces them to jump through interminable hoops to be able to get paid, and then they get a check for six cents. I had another physician who told me he got a check for a penny, and I said, please tell me that you saved that check. He said, no, threw it away. He was mad. So we need to look at what can we do instead? Well, as a candidate, Mr. Biden has called for building on Obamacare, which doesn't mean fixing it. It means just putting more money into it. He would establish a public option. That's a government-run health insurance plan that would pay providers less than private insurance does today and try to compete with private insurers. They would have government funding. They would have the ability to basically be able to set prices paying uh, as a way of trying to keep, keep premiums down, but it would absolutely wind up pushing private insurers out of business. Very, very difficult for them to compete with a plan that has government funding, really unlimited government funding, can set prices, can set premiums at zero, and you know, people will be start moving into this plan and dropping private coverage. It's really, we think, a slow walk or Trojan horse to government-run health care. Mr. Biden also wants to increase premium tax credits in the Affordable Care Act so that everybody could be eligible. Right now, the cutoff is 400% of poverty, as I'm sure you know, about $100,000 a year for a family. But he would basically make the premium tax credits available to, to anyone in the individual market, even if they make two, three, four hundred percent of poverty, five, six, seven hundred percent of poverty. And he would allow low income people in states that haven't expanded Medicaid to enroll in this public option free uh, plan free of charge, which would be basically an, an another expansion of Medicaid. So all of these really are expanding the role of government in the health sector. So we really believe Congress still needs to act. Health insurance premiums have gone up a, more than 100% just in the first few years after the Affordable Care Act passed. Actually, surprisingly, and this gets almost new, no news coverage, but the Trump administration has done a lot both to stabilize the individual markets in the, in the exchanges and also to level off premiums. And in fact, this, this year, premium increases actually went down. But there, we, what we've seen is so much disruption in employer-based health insurance and particularly small businesses that are finding it for lots of reasons, very difficult to survive anyway. And with growing costs of health coverage, there's been a 24% decrease in small employers offering coverage. And yet we are on track to spend 1.6 trillion on this uh, Health Affordable Care Act over 10 years. I think we can do better. We did some surveys with uh, the Heritage Foundation actually provided this information to us of so some surveys of what do people really want? And members of Congress really like 90% um, things that 90% of the American people agree with because they feel that that's, that really shows that, their, that whatever policies that they offer built around those ideas could have broad support. So 91% of Americans in the survey said that Americans should have more choices over their health care. 90% patients, not bureaucrats, should choose how health care is provided. 90% believe, like Milton Friedman said, that people spend their own money more wisely and carefully than they spend other people's money. So if you tell somebody that something's free, they're not going to be nearly as careful as they would as if they had a health savings account and they were spending money out of their health savings account and really would therefore be more conscious and careful about whether or not they needed that visit to the emergency room or they could have called a teledoc or whether or not they might've done a better job in getting a lower price for an MRI if they'd called the next, the next number um, down, uh, for a facility down the street. And almost 90% agree that healthcare should give people more choices to pick the health care plan that they would prefer. So what are we like to, likely to see in 2021? I think if we have 
a divided government, and Georgia is going to decide that for us, then I think we're going to very likely not see an active enactment of major reforms. I think it would be a very heavy lift to get the public option through a McConnell-led Senate, for example. But smaller steps really, I think, could be possible. Focus on COVID-19 is obviously going to be a top priority, and we can talk about that separately. Um, surprise medical billing. There's absolute agreement. There's really 100% agreement in Congress that we need to do something about surprise medical billing, but there are differences in, in the approach and how you do that. Do you do it through government setting rates so that doctors can't charge more than a certain amount? Or do you say that doctors and hospitals need to negotiate as they do in 90% of the cases now and have some federal guardrails, especially for um, unexpected care, emergency care? Prescription drug pricing, always high on everyone's list, even though prescription drug prices actually fell, I think by 1.4% last year, overall increases in prescription drug prices. And I think one of the things we've seen in this pandemic is how vital the private pharmaceutical industry has been in their operation warp speed production of, of potential vaccines. And there are other bipartisan issues that I think that we could address. Regulatory relief. People have loved telemedicine visits, and we've had to actually, Congress and the administration had to relax rules in order to make those as available as they've been. Well, let's make that permanent. And there's a lot of um, consolidation in the health industry that is really making it anti-competitive so that a hospital basically can charge anything if it is, it's the only hospital system in a, in a community, and the insurance company is to take it or leave it. So I think we need to have the FTC look at some of these issues in order to be able to really open up competition and get prices down. So I think those are some of the things that we might be able to look at. But as you see, it's not really sweeping reform if the divided government, um, Congress, presidency continue. So I just want to talk briefly about the plan that I've been working on for many months with colleagues in the health policy community. Rebecca mentioned that I facilitate the health policy consensus group. It's made up of now well over 200 people that we work with to really build consensus about market-based patient-centered health reform. And we call it the Healthcare Choices 2020 plan. You see the website here, healthcarechoices2020.org. I invite you to go there and look at the plan, executive summary, all the signatories. We have about 85 people and from major leading organizations, physicians, including many physicians who've supported this plan and would really love to have all of you actually joining and supporting it as well. So let me give you just kind of a quick overview of this plan. So it's really designed to reduce costs and spur innovation. This is not an overall, we're not gonna to try to overhaul the entire health sector, right? We're gonna focus on this dysfunctional individual market for health insurance as, a, as the, basically the foundation for, for health coverage, get that to work better so more people can afford coverage and begin to introduce more innovations into the, into the system. Offer people more choices. And we believe that the federal government is just really out of its element in trying to micromanage something as complex and regional as the health insurance market. States have decades of experience in managing their health insurance markets. And we want them to be able to unwind some of the rules and regulations, get rid of, they, they can decide which of the, of the Obamacare rules and regulations work for their state. If they don't work and they're driving up the costs of coverage to the point that millions of people can't afford to buy a policy, then maybe we need to rethink those. That can much better be done at a state level by basically redeploying the resources that are currently going to big insurance companies and then and providing states with grants and some guidelines to be able to improve their market. So that's sort of the basic structure of the plan. As I said, um, a broad group of supporters, policy experts, grassroots organizations, um, professionals in the, in the health sector to allow health insurance to be more portable and secure, um, as I say, converting that $1.6 trillion in federal entitlements from sending in just checks to insurance companies to really giving states the power and the resources to make people, um, to help their markets improve, to 
get coverage for people who can't afford policies, and particularly to do a better job of helping those with pre-existing conditions. The Affordable Care Act just basically threw everybody into the same insurance pool. Well, there have been a number of experiments lately with Section 1332, a provision in the Affordable Care Act that gives states more flexibility, that if they have a better way to take care of the sick and vulnerable, then they can use some, a portion of those resources that otherwise are just going to, to the insurance companies to do a better job of setting up high-risk pools, invisible high-risk pools, reinsurance pools, so that people with chronic conditions, with pre-existing conditions, can actually have dedicated resources to help them access better care. We want to increase price transparency. We, would, we have provisions to address surprise billing. My colleague, Doug Badger, has done a lot of work on that. I can send you papers on it. Um, and as I said, really redeploying resources to help those with high, high medical expenses. We also think that health savings accounts are a really great tool for people. Again, instead of sending the whole, the whole amount off to a health insurance company, put some of that into an account that you can control, have perhaps a, a policy that may have a different structure so that you can control resources on spending maybe on a physician that you want to see that's not in your network, well, you'd have some money to be able to do that. And also there's a, there's a new, um, a new, sort of innovation in healthcare delivery, although it sort of moves back to the way healthcare used to be delivered. Direct primary care, you've probably heard about it. I mean, Benjamin Rush has been a, a big supporter of that where people pay a stipend to a physician and really have unlimited access to primary care. The doctor often can get medications, for generic medications for pennies and save them a lot of money and also really help to be a facilitator for care if they have a more serious condition. Almost everyone needs to have, um, have a major medical policy in addition, but it's, it's really a hugely user-friendly and patient-friendly innovation. Health sharing arrangements, um, health uh, sharing ministries, lots of, lots of innovation. My colleague, uh, Brian Blaze from the Galen Institute was with the Trump administration for a long time, and he helped usher through a number of regulations that also increased choice and competition. One, I think has the potential to become sort of a 401k for health insurance. It's called health reimbursement arrangements, individual coverage, health reimbursement arrangements. Allows an employer, for example, to give a direct, a direct contribution to employees for the value of the amount that the employer would spend on their health coverage. So the individual can take that money and go out and purchase a policy in the individual market that they may prefer that, um, that better suits their needs and still get the same tax advantage as though it were offered by an employer. So again, you can learn more about our plan at healthcarechoices2020.org. And really the bottom line is that we wanna put doctors and patients and families in control of healthcare decisions not government bureaucrats that are never going to see our faces. And I don't want us to turn again to this. I have to tell you, when this chart was created as the Affordable Care Act was, was being debated, actually, so before, before it passed, there was a staffer at the Joint Economic Committee who said, I, I kind of understand this, and I understand things visually. So she, she did a, a schematic to show all the new programs, all the new spending, how it was connected, who was the power, who was making decisions on this. And I have to tell you, when I first saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, it's just so completely incomprehensibly uh, complex. But she said, you know, that's only about a, a half of the bill. And I now understand she's right. I, I know pretty much most of the provisions in this bill now after 10 years. And that's really not where we want to go. So I do a weekly newsletter, American Healthcare Choices. So I'd love to add you. It's free. I'd love to add you to my list. Just send me an email or you can go to the Galen Institute website, galen.org and sign up there and go back to questions and answers. So thanks, Rebecca. Hi. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am excited to get into some questions here. I think... Um, you know, we, we had a kind of a big blow 
and this is a great question. We had kind of a blow um, a couple of weeks ago when um, some of our supposed, what we, who we thought were going to be friends on the Supreme Court talked about individual mandate. Um, what do you think, how do you think that's going to, uh, when the Supreme Court finally comes down with a decision about individual mandate, how do you think um, that's going to impact where we move in the future with um, the ACA? Well, the, the individual mandate um, has always been the most unpopular part of this law. And even when the Supreme Court upheld the, the, uh, the we call it Obamacare, in the tw first challenge in 2012, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts decided, well, yes, the individual mandate actually is unconstitutional. You cannot compel someone under the Constitution to purchase a private product with their private money. But he said, they said there's a penalty if you don't do this. And he redefined that as a tax. He said, basically, it's optional. You don't have to purchase health insurance if you agree to pay the tax. So the individual mandate penalty increased, actually it became pretty significant before it was sunset by the House of Representatives in 2017 through the Tax and, Tax and Jobs Act, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And they basically, because of the processes they were using, they couldn't strike the individual mandate from the law, but they could zero out the penalty, which had the same effect but the individual mandate is still on the book. So the Texas Public Policy Foundation, along with about 24 state attorneys general, sued and went back to the Supreme Court for a third time and basically said that because there's no longer a tax associated with the individual mandate, therefore the law needs to fall because the law had actually is basically the drafters of this law felt the individual mandate was sort of the center pillar in the tent. You had to force everybody to purchase health insurance or the whole system would not work. And so without the tax, they felt the law would fail. So it was very interesting when the, when the Supreme Court held oral arguments a week ago Tuesday that Justice Roberts into questioning both sides kind of admitted that, oh, maybe I was wrong because he said they told me in 2012 the whole law was going to collapse if you didn't have the individual mandate. So he really contrived a decision, a, a majority of one, and it's unbelievably convoluted how he got there, but a majority of one, go to scotusblog.org, I think it is, and you can find a lot of background on that, that, that to uphold the individual mandate. Well, he said you know, the individual, Justice Roberts said during the hearings last week, he said, you know, the individual mandate hasn't been in effect for now a couple of years. Not much has changed. He said, maybe, maybe that was wrong. So I, I think that the most likely outcome, Rebecca, is that the Supreme Court decides to strike the individual mandate as unconstitutional. And it therefore, um, but that it holds, upholds the rest of the law, basically saying, if Congress wants to change the law, that's their job, not our job. But here's the here's the, the glitch. They're likely not to issue a decision until June. They always hold their healthcare decisions until the last day of the session, which would be June of 2021. And if the Democrats were to control all both the White House and both branches of Congress, they could reinstitute a penalty, so even if it's $1, then there's a penalty associated with the individual mandate, and that would moot this Supreme Court decision. So that's another really interesting complexity in what happens with this Supreme Court case and the outcome of this election. That's a really, that's very interesting. I, I hadn't heard that before, but that is very interesting. Um, this is from one of our alumni who is a resident now. Um, some states are allowing mid-level providers, such as nurse practitioners and physician assistants, to practice independently from doctors in an effort to decrease costs. As a doctor, I'm concerned that patients may receive a lower standard of care if this happens. What is your perspective on this? You absolutely could not be more correct. I am really frightened about that. And I think that one of the things that happens when 
government is making decisions about care and patients have many fewer choices, that they say, well, here's your provider, use that term, and here's your provider, what difference does it make to you whether it's a nurse or a physician? Well, it can make a lot of difference. It actually could make a life and death decision. Nurse, there is a reason that, that the physicians go through the amount of training that you are going through, both a medical school, residency, years of training so that you can be make sophisticated decisions quickly, often and truly life and death decisions. And, and nurses who are used to practicing under, and mostly spent their careers practicing under the supervision of physicians, simply do not have that experience and that ability. And I actually have a friend who nearly died because a nurse practitioner took over for her physician during when he was away on an August vacation. And she um, basically missed a, a serious infection and she wound up on a ventilator for a month and nearly died because the nurse did not have the ability to see the signs of a serious infection before it really became serious. So, so I am hugely supportive of doctors and patients making decisions and people practicing at the top of their education and training. But that does not mean that a nurse can take over for a physician, even if a health insurance company says, well, well, we can pay the nurse so much less. Well, okay, you can, but do you want to put your life on the line for that? I don't think so. We actually spoke to um, a physician named Dr. Rebecca Bernard a few months ago. She actually, uh, and she is a huge proponent of uh, physician-led care. She just wrote a book on it. Um, and it's an amazing concept to understand I'm not a physician. Um, nobody would want me to be. Um, <laughs> and it's just a remarkable to understand the different number of training hours that go on between a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, and then an MDDO and what that means. And to understand those numbers, just those numbers is um, pretty remarkable. So um, it, it's pretty incredible to understand that. So, um, another question if the government, uh, from a supporter, if the government began to allow we the people choose their healthcare alternative, won't they want to micromanage it? Well, you, the problem is that, that there just aren't enough choices out there. And that's really one of the reasons for our Healthcare Choices 2020 plan and a new vision for health reform, because we know that people need more, more choices. They, they need more choices of basic insurance. They need in choices of major medical if that's, pref if, that's, if that's preferred. They need to be able to have direct primary care even in, in government programs, um, health sharing ministries, there's so many innovations possible in our health sector, but everything is so constrained by rules and regulations of what government is saying they can do. And in many cases, if you don't purchase that insurance, certainly when we had the individual mandate in place, you had to buy exactly the policy that Washington prescribed or you would pay a large fine. And by the way, most of the fines wound up being paid by people who made $50,000 a year or less, because above that, people are much more likely to have compliant employer-based health insurance. It was the most vulnerable people who wound up being the hit the hardest. And so we've got to give people more choices. And the only way you're gonna do that, federal government has shown that it just is out of its element. We have to devolve power back to the states with incentives and their guidelines and incentives in our plan so that states provide more options for private coverage. They make that coverage more affordable by relaxing rules and regulations and giving people decisions about what kind of coverage they want. People know they want to protect their families, just like that dad in Fredericksburg. They want to protect their families, but they, if they don't have any choices, they're just, they don't know what to do. So choices are absolutely crucial in order to be able to get costs down and, and really engender competition in our health sector. One of the things that you mentioned was, um, was direct primary care. Um, and one of the things that has happened in the past year um, was uh, allowing, uh, through the Trump administration, was allowing health, uh, health savings accounts, HSAs, to, um, to help pay for that for, um, for direct primary care 
Um, what other things do you see that are needed and might actually work and get passed um, in this new Congress if it happens in the way through Georgia that we're that we're at least that our advocates are crossing their fingers um, happens? Yeah, I think some of the smaller stuff. Our our healthcare choices plan mm-hmm. actually has several dozen individual recommendations, and it's it can it's a full plan, but. It also could be a menu of choices of things that might be able to be done. But our primary goal initially is protecting a lot of the choice and competition regulations that were instituted by the Trump administration. And they're all vulnerable because they were, they were, they, Congress basically made, except for the getting rid of the individual mandate, Congress did nothing in the last four years in health reform. All of the innovations have come through the administrative rulemaking process. They, they created a rule to create association health plans so these vulnerable small businesses could aggregate and get some of the economies of scale of larger businesses so that people could purchase short-term limited duration policies but not and have them last for longer than the 90 days that the, the Obama administration constrained them to. The Obama administration saw these more affordable, more flexible plans as competition for the ACA. So what they do, they try to, they shut them down. Well, the, administ- the Trump administration had to go through a complex rulemaking process to give people more options for short-term plans that can now be extended up to 36 months. This is now an option for that dad in Fredericksburg and their quality coverage. I've testified a bunch of times before Congress to, they always say, oh, these are junk plans. They are not. When you look at the data, they are very competitive. People want good insurance, so that's what they buy. This, and I also mentioned the health reimbursement arrangements, that this is a way for employers to be able to give employees more choices and basically say, you know, this $5,000 we're spending on your health insurance, it's really part of your salary package. So if you want to, then I'm going to give you the choice of being able to take that and buy a policy of your choice in the individual market. But for that to happen, we have to get the individual market to work better, which is why the, the, the grants to states, the formula grants to states, I think are really so important. And then transparency, the administration's rules for both hospitals and health insurance companies to be able to, to be forced to, to help to allow people to know the actual cost of something, something new and different in the health sector. So we're, the initial thing is protecting those rules and regulations so that consumers are well served by the choices and competition that the Trump administration has spent four years building. Well, transparency is where we are going to go next. Um, you've been a huge advocate for, for transparency. Um, you know, we worked hard with our students and with uh, some coalitions that we're a part of to move transparency through. And again, it's through, it wasn't through Congress. Um, it was through the administration. It was through a rule. Um, and we're proud to see where that is, two, two, right, two rules. Um, we're proud to see where that, where that is now. Um, now how to, what's next with transparency? You mentioned in your plan, um, we have to look at pharmacy. We have to look at drugs. Um, what's next? You know, the, I don't know if you saw the this, this story yesterday that um, that Amazon is now going to start delivering yes. prescription medicines. Well, that's that's really disruptive because that means that that, that people are going to have a lot of other choices. And if anybody buys at scale, you know, buys in bulk, it's going to be Amazon to be able to find to get lower prices. I remember the innovation when Walmart decided that it wanted to, to do something to help people with their prescription drug costs, and it said, you know. There's almost no generic medication that we couldn't fill for $4 for a month's supply or $9 for a three-month supply. And so that's what they did. It was a huge innovation. And, it, and, Wal, and Walgreens and CVS all screamed and yelled, but eventually they met those prices. So what Amazon's going to do, I think, is very likely to be disruptive. And we also see Walmart now with really expensive clinics. They've been introduced two in Georgia and the Atlanta area where you can buy, you can go see a psych- psychotherapist and you pay by the minute. Maybe you only need to see somebody for five minutes to get a prescription renewed. You don't have to pay for an hour of that, of that person's time. They have walk-in clinics. They can do all sorts of you know, routine care, the care that, that 90% of office visits care, take care of. 
on a much more affordable basis. So I think that if we allow the market to work, people are going to have more choices. And I'm seeing them bubbling up now. It would just be tragic if that, if that all gets crushed by government coming in and, and stopping it because they see this competition to government programs. That would be a tragedy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I ask everyone that joins us is, you know, especially since we started this series um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and we're continuing it because most of our medical schools are now closing again, uh, or going completely virtual where they were in some kind of hybrid model. Um, there have been so many regulations that have been put on pause uh, due to the pandemic that we have been huge advocates for just eliminating um, because we don't need them. Uh, things like, and you mentioned telemedicine um, is one that would kind of be an easy, an easy thing to, uh, to look at almost immediately because we've seen just it being a wonderful thing to uh, that we've benefited from since the pandemic. What else do you think uh, we need to look at and what else would be um, beneficial right away? Because there have been so many. Um, I can name a few right away in Virginia um, that we've been. That we've been examples. Yeah. Uh, so we do. Um, we have had a couple of cases and we both live in Virginia. Um, there have been a couple of cases where we have had the ability to, so COS laws where um, you have tried to put up a, a temporary hospital and we had to work with Northam to um, not to be able to actually do that. And he had to repeal or put an executive order. You mean um, CON, certificate of need laws? CON laws, woo. Mm -hmm. um, so that we could, um, certificate of need, if you don't know what a CON law is, um, so that we could actually put up uh, temporary hospitals where there weren't, um, they didn't have that certificate of need law before, if you're not familiar with a CON or certificate of need rule or law. So I think that is one that across the board, uh, we need to look at those regulations because there shouldn't be. Well, and I, I mean, I really, I think that the pandemic as horrible as it's been in so many ways, it really has shown how government can get in the way of an efficient uh, rapid response to the pandemic. And we saw it, I think, especially in the partnership, really a partnership between the federal government, the FDA and private pharmaceutical companies to figure out how can we get this vaccine, a safe, effective vaccine created as soon as possible. Usually that takes 10 years from, from idea to the first injection. It's been what seven, eight months. So that we're and we're FD, the Pfizer, um, the Pfizer vaccine is likely to get farm, uh, FDA approval in the next week or two. And they have been manufacturing this vaccine for months, and and to, because they knew it worked, and they knew that once it's approved, you can't then start making tens of millions of doses. You have to be doing that all along. So the FDA allowed them to certify their manufacturing processes for a drug that was in the process of approval. And had it not worked, Pfizer would have been out, you know, billions of dollars in, uh, in not being able to do this. But now we see it has a 95% effective rate. They were so sure that they started the manufacturing process in advance, the same thing with Moderna. So those kinds of partnerships are just, they're just dazzling to me to see what happens when the government works with rather than against private businesses in trying to help facilitate changes. There are a lot of laws on the books, the Stark laws, for example, former, former Congressman Pete, Pete Stark was in Congress forever and put more rules and regulations in effect governing the health market and particularly what physicians can and cannot do in their office practices. Both sides, liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats all agree that those are antiquated. They were designed for a system built in 1965, not 2020. And so there's a big movement to be able to re relax the Stark laws. The Affordable Care Act, and I use that term loosely, um, had 
provision that stopped a private physician owned hospitals from being able to build, to expand or to build new facilities. And yet these, these hospitals are the most innovative. They are efficient. They have high quality care because doctors are able, doctors run them and they are the ones who are making decisions of, even about how the, the operating room is set up to maximize their care. And they, the, the, the surgery center of Oklahoma, I think in particular is a, is a wonderful example, but we need to allow more physician owned hospitals because they work. Well, guess what? The big community hospitals see them as competition as well they should. And because of their power and cloud in Washington, they have kept Washington from being able to expand those. One of the provisions, one of the several dozen regu re recommendations on our healthcare choices plan is to open up access to more physician owned hospitals being expanded and created. I, we had uh, Keith Smith, Dr. Keith Smith on uh, two weeks ago, um, and he's, he, he's wonderful. And listening to the advent of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, um, you know, they're, they're such big supporters, clearly, of what we do. But I happened to get him on the day that the, the, the last transparency rule was, was um, announced. So it was just, it was interesting for me because I think he's kind of, in the little world that we live in, um, kind of the grandfather of that. Um, That's great. It was, it's wonderful to, to hear that is part of what your plan is yeah. because it is so important that we support the physician run uh, hospital. There is nobody better to do it. Um, it leads kind of to a, an issue um, because medical students don't have a business background. They don't have business in school. Um, how do you, and I ask everyone this one as well, um, knowing that you're not a physician and you haven't been to medical school, um, what would you say to that? What would you say to the fact that um, the AMA has become more political in the last 18 months? Um, their policy, uh, their they're adding economics, they're adding um, climate change. Uh, that, those things are being added to medical school curriculums, but what they're not adding is business uh, to the, the curriculums. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I really do think that there's so much politicization in academia and certainly in medical schools. A friend of mine, Dr. Sally Settel, who works with the American Enterprise Institute actually wrote a book I don't know, in, the, in the early 2000s, called PCMD, the political correctness in medicine, and how that really corrupts the science of, of truth and what physicians need to know. Masks are a perfect example, you know. This, the data shows, and this broad study in Denmark over recently showed that masks, it doesn't make a difference whether you're wearing masks or not in the infection rate. And yet the, the politicians still insist that everybody has to wear a mask because they don't really know what else to do. So I think the real risk is the more power that we give government over decisions or academia over decisions, the less power doctors and patients and really science will have over really guiding change and reform in the right way. So yes, does, does client, climate change have a role in medical school? Not sure, but I bet there's a lot of funding behind that. I, I, want, I want physicians as scientists to be able to make the right decisions for their patients, not a politically directed decision. And that's kind of, that's, that's my issue. Um, I say my, I, you know, that's the issue that we're looking at is, uh, to ensure that whatever they're learning and whatever the curriculum is, isn't driven by the money behind it. It's driven by the science because that's what they, the, the, their patients deserve. Their patients don't deserve uh, the, the- And Rebecca, I think also the fact that we have so many physicians in Congress that have you know, just gotten fed up and said, I'm gonna go see if I can make some changes from the top. Those really are the audience because they know this from their own experience and from the experience of their children who may be going through medical school and from 
So those are the physicians. And Dr. Roger Marshall, who member of the House from Kansas, just got elected to the Senate, mm -hmm. for example. He's a really great leader, Dr. Cassidy. Um, Dr. Barrasso from Wyoming, Wyoming's doctor, they call it. These are physicians who are, are in Congress because they want to preserve and protect medical practice so that it can be based upon the Hippocratic Oath and not based upon what the latest, um, the latest political correctness directive is. One of the things that we do, that we try to do is to teach our students that when they become physicians, the letters after their name become so much more powerful in advocacy. Um, and they can advocate in so many different ways, whether it is loud and vocal, and it's picketing and uh, you know, being on, the, on TV, or it's in different ways. Um, what would you say to that, to being advocates uh, and using the MD or the DO after their name? How, what would you say to that? I actually just had a conversation yesterday with a physician, a very senior professor from uh, Johns Hopkins University who said he's just so frustrated at seeing inaccurate reports about what's happening both with COVID and in medical care in general. And he said, I want to have a bigger voice. He says, I don't, I don't know how to write op-eds. He says, I know how to write journal articles. But he was clearly very, you know, very communicative. And I think he would be a great person to get on TV, to do radio shows. I told him I'd be happy. I was a journalist early in my career. I said, I'd be happy to help you learn the style of op-ed writing. But I could not encourage you more to be engaged in advocacy for things that you care about. When I was a reporter, one of the things, you know, to have so many different cut stories that editors were telling you, go cover this, go cover that. But the ones that I really cared about, that I really stuck with, were the ones that, that really spoke to me, the things that, that really mattered. And I wound up winning all sorts of awards for all of these, these articles that I write because I was passionate about them. And I think that's really what you have to listen to. You know, what, what do you really care about? There's in this huge $3.6 trillion health sector, it's so vast that you can't know it all. You can't change it all. But there can be specific things that really matter to you. Develop a voice in that. Develop some expertise. And, and media outlets, at least they used to, we'll see if they still do, want people with expertise, and particularly the MD behind your name, learn to be able to communicate something that you're passionate about with facts and arguments, not, not as an opinion. You can argue for a point of view, but do it based upon the facts that you know. Very, very credible. And I couldn't encourage you more strongly to, to engage in the public debate because so many of the decisions that are going to affect your careers are made there. Right. And that's, I think that is the main point that we try to encourage is these, these decisions that are being made, it's your profession. Uh, it's also for your patients. You know, we talk a lot about the doctor patient relationship and that's what we're founded on is maintaining that doctor patient relationship. Um, if they are not the ones that are advocating for it, you know, who's going to, because it's there, that's, that's what they got into medicine for. Um, so that's, you know, I, I think you're a fantastic person to ask that question to. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your contact information. And uh, something I want to encourage is I have put up on all of our dif different uh, social media channels, um, your healthcare plan, I've put up the web address. Um, we will we'll put that also um, on the recording. Don't forget that all of our recordings are on our YouTube channel. So you can just uh, search Benjamin Rush Institute on YouTube. Um, we'll make sure that it's included on the recording as well. Um, I encourage you to go check out the website, um, check out the healthcare plan. Um, it has a lot of really wonderful suggestions and things that we need to continue to fight for in this new administration and in the new Congress. Um, it is your profession. So these are things that are going to be your future. Um, if you do have any other questions, uh, you can get in contact with me at Rebecca at BenjaminRushInstitute.org. Um, we will continue to put up um, Grace Marie's contact information on the recording so you can get in touch with her as well. Uh, Grace Marie Turner, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you have just so much wonderful experience in this in the policy arena. 
um, so much advocacy work for everything that we do. And thank you for continuing the fight. Um, you, Rebecca. So and, and also, we don't have any medical stu students yet as signatories to our plan. And I'd love to have some Benjamin Rush Institute supporters and medical students as signatories to our plan. So you can send me a note at gracemarie at galen.org if you feel that our plan really is the kind of vision of health reform that you'd like to see in your career and you'd like to support it. So I invite you to become a signatory. There you go, guys. There's your, there's your chance. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, thank you all. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter if you're not already. And you will, can find out about everything we have planned for the rest of this year uh, and upcoming in 2000 and wow, 2021. So mm -hmm. thank you all very much. Bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. To learn more about our educational programs and events just like the virtual events series, I encourage you to visit our website. While you're there, you can subscribe to the Benjamin Rush Institute's YouTube channel and link not only to all episodes in this series, but also to all of our past meetings, events, and conferences. And please consider supporting our work on behalf of the medical students we serve by donating to our efforts. Your support is vital if we are to continue to provide important educational programs and events just like this one. We appreciate your support and please watch for your invitation to the next edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series.